Back in Lesson 8, Chapter 8 of the book of Proverbs, Solomon is saying to his son Rehoboam, uh, uh, talking about uh, wisdom and understanding, and actually tells Rehoboam some of the words that wisdom would actually say to him if wisdom could speak like a person. Uh, previous to chapter 8, chapters 1 through 7, Solomon has talked to Rehoboam, his son, about this woman by the name of Folly. And so the whole picture has been set up that there's a woman named Folly and there's a woman named Wisdom. And Wisdom, if you go and you grasp hold of Wisdom, understanding comes along too. And in chapter 8, uh, Solomon explains to us that Wisdom was with the Lord even before anything was created on this earth. Uh, this earth was created before the heavens were created, before the stars were hanging in place. Wisdom was there with the Lord in the beginning. Wisdom uh, can speak, uh, Solomon per personifies wisdom uh, as a person to allow us to think of her, and he actually calls uh, wisdom a her, uh, that she will be with you and she will guide you and she does special things for you. So as we pick up here in chapter 9, Solomon is going to continue talking about what wisdom has to say to us. It says, wisdom has built her house. Solomon speaking now. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out seven pillars. She has prepared her food. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her maidens, and she calls from the tops of the heights of the city. Now, I've placed those things up here on the board. Her house, her pillars, her food, her wine, her table, her maidens, and her call. These are the things that she is going to has made and is going to use to take a person down the right road. And in these nine chapters, we have discovered that Solomon is saying for all of us that we are born and we start out very simple in our thinking and very naive in our thinking. And as we go through life on a straight path, trying to go where we're supposed to go, there is going to come a time where we're going to hit a block we're going to hit a corner that we have to make a decision where we are going to go either to one direction or the other. We're either going to head towards wisdom or we're going to head towards foolishness. And Solomon spent seven chapters of the, of the book of Proverbs to talk about uh, the folly, the, the activity of folly to get you to go that direction. Now let me remind you of those things. Folly goes out on her corner. Her husband has gone away, according to Solomon, uh, on a business trip and will not be back until the first full moon, which means the beginning of the month. She goes out. She's painted herself. She's adorned herself. She's put on very seductive clothing. She is out there very boisterous, very uh, uh, speaking loudly to different people, trying to invite them to turn and to come in here. Come in and go in to see uh, my couch that I have material made down in Egypt across the couch. You know, Egyptian cotton type stuff. There is the aloe, the moisture oils are there, the, the perfect. Perfumes are in the air. The bed has been sprinkled with perfumes. The lattice work is up. The flowers are there. Come and see what I have to you. And she's trying to lure someone, uh, some young man, into her house uh, that is not her husband because her husband has gone off. If you remember, that's the picture. For seven chapters, we said that. It caused me to think about this, and I've thought about it many years in my life. People will say to me, you know, I read one proverb every day of my life. You know, the day of the month, I read that chapter of the proverb. And I keep thinking, so on days one through seven of every month, you're, talk, you're thinking a lot about adultery because <laughs> that's what you are. In fact, almost to the point of us saying, do we have to have another lesson on adultery? Because it was seven chapters of adultery trying to explain. To Rehoboam, the message that this young, he, Solomon wants his young son not to fall into. And I think probably the reason why was because Solomon had a problem with adultery. I mean, 700 wives, 300 concubines, and... Uh, 
uh, untold other maidens, the scripture says to us. Evidently, there was a little bit of a problem with women that Solomon had. And Rehoboam is the only son that um, Solomon actually claims to be his son, although we do know that, that according to the... Uh, uh, according to information that the Queen of Sheba was pregnant when she left Solomon and headed back down to Sheba. But we do not know if the son was actually born or, or what happened with that son. So we don't know. And there's a, because he had all the concubines, concubines were there for the purpose of having children. And so probably Solomon had more than what is actually recorded in the Bible. He's talking to Rehoboam. Rehoboam is the main son that is going to inherit the throne from him. Well, with this, Solomon is saying, look, if you, when you're headed down life, uh, folly is going to try to get you to go her direction. But wisdom is going to be there too, going to be calling. It's a why in the road. You have to choose a, a, a direction. By the way, you can't keep going straight. You have to choose a path. Now, I don't know how you are, but I know how I was as a, as a child growing up. There was many times I chose the way of folly. There were many times that I got four or five steps into the way of folly and realized I was in the wrong place at the wrong time and I needed to get out of here and get out of here quickly. Now, the main place where I learned that was in college. The worst thing for me was to graduate from high school, hop in my car, and move two and a half hours away from my mama. I'm not so sure that was a good thing because... Most everybody else that off was out of college too. Uh, we did not study as much as we played. Uh, we uh, thought it was more fun to go uh, spend, you know, all night at the local uh, cafe kettle. It was called a kettle there, and drink coffee and all that type of stuff and talk and laugh than it was to actually study. And so. Uh, we would find ourselves back there at the same place on study nights when some of the others would be wanting to, uh, because that was our favorite thing to do, because, you know, we were, we were like most college kids, we were solving the problems of the world because that's the type of person I was. We were talking about what we could do to change the world and how things ought to be. You know, I wish I'd have known back then what I knew now about how things really work in the world because I would not have said most of the things that I said back then. In fact, it was interesting, just this past week as I was doing Bible study, I ended the day and, and I didn't put it on Facebook, but normally I, I post things that I'm thinking on Facebook. Actually, they all come from Scripture. And, and one of the things that had come, kind of come was I realized that just last week as I was ending my study that I had learned more about God that day in my Bible study than everything I had ever learned all my life. And then the problem was, or the paradox was, 41 years ago when I entered the ministry, I knew everything about God, and you couldn't have tell me anything I didn't know about God already. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? That's just the way we are. Well, we head down these paths. I am forever grateful whenever I was taking pilot's license. There was one little thing, kind of a parable, not really a parable, but I remember what my, pilot, my teacher taught me. He said, Jim, if you're ever flying into a cloud and you get into a cloud, and you realize that you're in trouble, just real calmly and real carefully hold your altitude, but make a 180 and back and turn right around and go right back to where you came from and go back to where you know the skies were clear. And from there, stay in the clear, even if you have to go down and land on a street somewhere. And in fact, in my life, there was a couple of times where I either landed on a street and one time one time I actually landed in a field where the rows had already been cut and I was just fortunate I was going with the rows and I had to land. I got out of the uh, airplane because I was so sick, went over and do what you do when you get sick in an airplane, got to feeling better and just took right off and did it again, you know, and went back to the airport and landed as quickly as I can. I remember these lessons from my father, from my flight instructor of what to do. Sometimes when we head down a way that we know is wickedness or folly, we need to turn around and go back to where we know it was clear and safe and head a different direction. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I am a, 
uh, almost 60 now, but I remember whenever I was 18, uh, when I was 15 and even 14, doing things that were just flat stupid, going down ways, uh, folly ways. Uh, Waxahachie Lake was one of was was where we uh, spent most of my times in my summer, and they had these oil pipes that were up way above the lake that went across the lake, and of course on the end of these big old pipes they had the big grill work it said do not pass do not trespass uh do not climb on this go climb around they were trying to keep us to be safe of course that was for everybody but me remember i knew everything about everything back then of course you did too and so in the summers we would go around and we would climb over those and we would walk out to our favorite little spot and we would dive off and we would jump off and we would have all this great time. That was so wonderful. We had a great time until my senior year when we had a drought and we were out there in canoes and we were canoeing through there and I go, I remember saying to Guy Adair, I said, his name was Otis, but we called him Guy. I said, Guy, What's that sticking up out of the water out there? He said, man, I don't know. And there were tree barbs sticking up out of the water right where we had been jumping the year before. And I'm going, we could have been poon jod. That's when I finally realized maybe I wasn't so smart after all. And the signs do not pass, do not trespass, danger was for me. Oh, it wasn't for me then, but it was later. We have to learn our lessons. We had gone down some paths of foolishness that we were, by the grace of God, protected. But that doesn't always happen. And I will tell you this. Even though you go down the path of foolishness and you, by the grace of God, are protected, it doesn't mean you don't come out with scars and damage and pain and hurt. Well, wisdom. If you head down the path that's built by wisdom... That's a whole different ball game. So I've listed them up here. She's built her house. Wisdom, Solomon says, has built her house. Now, for the foolish person, she's lived, that foolish woman, she's not built the house. She's living in her husband's house. But for wisdom, he has built the house. In fact, if uh, if we think about it like this, the house that wisdom built was explained to us in chapter 8. The house that wisdom built was with the Lord when in, in six days plus a day of rest, he created all the universe, he created his home, he created eternity. He created a place for us to have salvation for eternity. There is an awesome thought uh, about eternity for all of us, whether we like it or not whether we want to think about this or not. Because we are humans here on earth, one day we're going to face death. And we're going to possibly get sick and be put in the hospital. And the doctors will do the best they can do for us. They will do all they can do, but they are not gods. And they cannot do things that are against God. And God can work miracles, but sometimes the miracle that God works for us uh, he can work it one of two ways. He can ch either choose to extend physical life for us so that we see a miracle here on earth. Or for those of us be who belong to him, he can choose to extend eternal life for us, which is also a miracle. Did you catch it? And either way, we win. For those who do not have the Lord as their Savior, then physical life here turns to torment and agony and pain eternally. But for those of us who love the Lord, boy, I tell you what, whether we're here or whether we're there, it doesn't matter. Now, for those of us who are left behind, we grieve, we miss because we've loved. But one day we will do go, go the same way. Uh, we are going to either have physical life extended for us or we are going, the Lord is going to choose to give us eternal life. Either way, Either way, it's good for us. And for those of us, you know the old song, I won't have to cross old Chili Jordan alone. Chili Jordan is not chili for those of us who are on our way. Chili Jordan is only chili for those of us who are left behind, who haven't crossed over yet. Because I have sat and stood by the bedside of saint after saint after saint after saint, 
who have simply closed their eyes and gone on to be with the Lord, taken their last breath. I have been there. It has been a, a beautiful experience for them, not so beautiful for me to endure it, but for them. Because the passing was so easy. Then again, I have been by the bedside of person after person after person who has rejected the Lord and their crossing over has been agony and pain. Crying out uh, in distress. Now, since um, medications have now uh, become the way that we handle death in order to keep people comfortable, that has changed some of the ways that people experience death but not spiritual death, and not the death of the, uh, of the soul leaving the body, even though the medicines help our physical pain. Still, what is to come in eternity is what is to come. And it's all based on this why in the road that we go down, the biggie why. Do we follow the way of foolishness and reject the Lord? Or do we go to the house and we go to the house uh, of that woman out there, that uh, evil that's out there that's luring us towards evil? Or do we go towards, in the big picture, towards the Lord who has built a house that's big enough for us and it's setting there for us? The place where the Messiah is, the place where the Lord is, the place where Jehovah is, the place where Yahweh is. By the way, so they're all the same names for the same person. Are we going to be with the Lord? Uh, it says, Solomon says, her house has seven pillars. Remember, we are in a room that is very apropos for giving us a perspective of the size of something. The temple in Jerusalem that was built by Solomon was about the size of this room, within about five feet either way of this room. And on top of that, on each side, about ten feet away, one, two, two four, six, eight, ten, ten of that, come ten from that wall, the middle area where the veil, the veil was before the Holy of Holies was only about the middle section, about from, um, about right there, about the same distance from the wall back there. It was very skinny going up through. And it had little rooms over here where they, they prepared everything that was going to be, where the garments were held. It's not a big unit. And so the walls that were built inside of it, the timber that was cedars of Lebanon that were brought and cut, did not have to be extremely long and heavy to put up because they didn't have to span very far. Uh, it wasn't that big of a room. But in the same instance, when Solomon built his palace, remember the temple took seven years to build, Solomon's palace took 13 years to build, and it was enormous. The reason why the temple took seven years is because not one stone could be, could be cut within the distance to where you could hear the working of the stone on the temple mount. It had to be cut. If it got there and it didn't fit, the stone had to be hauled back away a far enough distance that it could not, you could not hear the chisels in the, uh, or anything working on it, and then it was brought back and put in place. The temple was built virtually in silence, by the way, of people planning what they were going to do way over there and coming over here to do it. We don't operate that way. We yell at people when we're building houses and, hey, send me that board up and shoot me that over here and I need some nails and plug the air compressor back in. Cut this for me, Sam Davis. In fact, it was interesting out at Dan Danbury, Sam, I don't know if you know Sam, Sam was incredible with a skill saw. He was better with a pair of tin snips. But with a skill saw, he would stand there down by the pile of wood, a pile of, 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 of plywood, and I would be up there measuring. He would watch me measure. I would give him hand signals of what it was, especially when there was an angle piece. I'd, I'd measure this way. I'd turn around. I'd give him the hand signals of what it was. I'd measure this way. I'd tell him what, what it was, and I'd say like that. He'd cut it. It fit perfect every time. I do not ever remember one single time that it ever did not fit. Now let me tell you about the shears, because it's just interesting. We were flashing everything around the doors. Sam would take a piece of metal and his shears. He would stand about 15 feet down from what we were uh, trying to uh, 
waterproof, and he'd cut, and he'd bend, and he'd look up there, and he'd cut, and he'd bend, and he'd cut, and he'd bend. He said, here, see if it fits. That sounds like right? Here, see if it fits. It would be perfect. He'd done it so many years. He'd, it's what he did for a living. Perfect. Okay. But a house in Solomon's day, like the palace, they had to go in, and they had to put up uh, pillars because the expanse was so big. Now, you've heard me talk about this, too. Solomon actually built a, a room that was called an armament. It was where they stored all of their swords and their clubs and their, and their daggers and their weapons and their armory and everything. It had 45 cedar of Lebanon trees inside of it that had been shaved and carved. And it, and it was a huge room where all the, the different cohorts and the thousand people could go in and all that and, and, and be in there and take instruction before they left. They called it the forest. That's what they called the room because when you went in, you saw 45 trees standing there as pillars, not, not concrete, but trees. Those trees allowed them to cause the roof to be huge in expanse. If you had a home back in this day that had seven pillars in it, what Solomon is saying, this was a large house. Wisdom has built a large house, vast covering, vast safety, vast expanse, so that anyone who wants to come to be under the shelter of that house, that can be your home, that can be your place to come and to live. It's a huge structure. He's done it, I mean, she's done it, she's built it because of love. Her food, interesting. The text up here says she has prepared her food. Now, you have noticed, and you will continue to notice, especially in next week's lesson, uh, that Proverbs is not translated accurately all the way through. I do this on every lesson that, that we have. You rarely hear me say, now in the Hebrew or in the Greek, you rarely hear me say, now in the Septuagint or in the Latin, the, uh, the Vulgate, it says this, you rarely hear me that because most of our Bible is translated very accurate. This is not, the Proverbs is not translated accurate uh, all the way through. Most of it is, but there's some places that if we go get what it actually said 250 years before Jesus was born in the Septuagint, the Septuagint is the Hebrew Bible translated into Greek 250 years before Jesus was born. Jesus carried the Septuagint. He knew about the Septuagint. He studied out of the Septuagint. We know that because of some of the wording that he used that was out of Septuagint instead of out of the Hebrew. But he also knew the Hebrew also. Here when it says her food, she has prepared her food. The better translation out of the Septuagint is she has killed her beast. You catch the difference? Beast. All right, when we say we've prepared our food, well, there's five of us here, so we're going to fix enough for five meals. We know how much we're fixing. But when we go kill a beast, that beast is more than enough for our family. If you go to Africa to hunt, be it elephant, rhinoceros, uh, you know, any of the big animals, and not the cats, but the big animals, they're going to take that meat and they're going to go and it will feed a tribal village for sometimes weeks. It's enough food. When the beast has been killed, you get the skin, but the animal meat is going to go to the nearest tribal village. That's just how they do it. Well, one beast feeds a lot. And that is what Solomon is trying to say here. Wisdom has killed her beast. That means all who want to come and eat, there'll be plenty there. It won't just be adding another cup of water or two cups of water to the soup to add, have enough for another bowl of soup. Like some of our parents did, you know. We had soup, you know, we, you know, we had soup for lunch and supper. and We had soup the next day for lunch and supper and we just kept adding water to it. Until finally it was just basically the bone with a little water. And I remember that too. Well, whoever's hungry, God has pre prepared a place where you can have enough food. Her wine, wisdom's wine has been prepared and it's ready for drinking. Not all will dare to drink her wine. Not everyone will say, I want wisdom's wine. They may be saying, I want the wine over there with that woman over there that is really dressed really nice. Ooh. 
Ooh, I've never seen such a woman like that. Besides, I'm going to be the only one over there with her. And look over here with wisdom. There's a whole bunch of people over here. I want to go this way. Okay. Has anybody seen the TV show Say Yes to the Dress? You've seen the Say Yes? Y'all like Say Yes to the Dress? Say Yes to the Dress is my favorite show in this world. It, it just warms my heart. Do you know why it's my favorite show in the world? Because it's my wife's favorite show in the world. Men, take a lesson right now. That's, that's a lesson. It is what we watch day and night. Say, we record it so that we can watch all the same episodes over and over and over again. There's an interesting phenomenon that I see there. Interesting phenomenon. You know, I would like to think that all the brides and all the girls in the world are just pure as the driven snow. You know, I've said that to you before. I, I, I like to believe that, that, they, that women are sinless, and yet they're not quite sinless. But I like to think that. It is one of the difficult things for me is when I'm watching Say Yes to the Dress, is to watch the women who come in, and in the midst of their past life, they have done something to their body that when it comes time to buy a wedding dress, they want that covered up. They want it covered up. Oh, they don't want to show that part of it. Oh, when the wedding's over, I'll show it again. You know, uh, maybe the tattoos down the back or, or maybe the, the silly things she did as a teenager that caused her to have to have surgery that caused a scar that she wants covered up. It could be something she did on purpose or something she did accidental, but it's there. And then I love the other show, I can't remember what it is, oh, What Not to Wear. That's what it is, What Not to Wear, because it's my second favorite show because it's my wife's second favorite show. <laughs> and there they take you in for this makeup stuff. But do you know that whenever you have chosen to have a, a piercing here, even four or five years after you take that piercing out, you still have the scar. And, and they say, can you cover this up a little bit? Or can you know that I, I want, I want uh, this was the good one that was on the other day. This gal had put those loops in their ears to where the ears went down real far. So she wanted a veil to cover that up. Okay, let's just make it even easier than that. Why is it that when we go to a wedding or to a funeral, we know how to dress properly, but when we come to church, we don't? What's going on here? Is the church the foolishness of the world, or is it the wisdom of God? Why in the world do we act like, say yes to the dress and what not to wear, all the rest? We, we, we know when it's right to cover something up to be proper, but we don't do it in our everyday life. What makes any difference of whether we're coming here to church or not? There's a proper way to dress, and I am just chewing out when I shouldn't be chewing. I'm going to go on down the road. You got my point. Okay? With this wine, there are some who will drink it from the fountain that flows from God, and some want to go over and get what foolishness has. But she's got her wine to drink, too. Wisdom has prepared the proper wine. It says with her table. Her table is set, it says. The banquet is prepared. And there's enough place for everyone. Oh, if you remember in chapters 1 through 7, if you went to the foolish adulterous woman's house, she only had one couch with a place just for her and for him to grope was the word, I think, each other. But over in the house of wisdom, the table is there for all who want to come and sit and eat that everything that's been prepared. There's a place for everyone in humanity who loves the Lord as their Savior to go towards wisdom. Her maidens was another one that's there. At the completion, in fact, this is a very typical tradition in Asia. Uh, back in those days, they would begin to prepare the food for all the guests who had been invited. And then when the meal was prepared, uh, they would send the maidens out to go tell everyone that had been invited, it's time to come and dine. Come and join us. You remember, Jesus even gave us a, a parable about this, about this great banquet that was prepared. And they sent out to everyone who had been invited. And the people who had been invited had something else better to do. One of them had to go look at his land 
you know, as if the land was going somewhere that he'd just bought. But it was more important than going to eat and dine at the at the uh, banquet that he had already accepted the invitation from. And then there was the man who all of a sudden got married and he didn't have he couldn't come to the banquet because he he needed to take care of the needs of his wife. Yeah, you bet. You know, he didn't want to come to the banquet that he accepted for, but he had something else. And and of course what happens in that, Jesus tells us that he sends his maidens out and he sends his servants out and says, "You go out to the highways and the byways and the hedges and you bring in anyone who is out there there who can come and tell them to wear their wedding clothes when they get here and of course you know the rest of the story there's one who shows up without his wedding clothes on and the Lord comes and says what are you doing here without your wedding clothes on here go out go out I'm casting you out into darkness because he wasn't prepared to be there the people who are going to be at the table are the ones who belong to the Lord it's very important Her table is set. The maidens go out. By the way, in that culture too, just add to it. When maidens went out, it was safe to go out. Yeah, right. It wasn't safe because they sent out the eunuchs who took care of the maidens to go in front of them to protect them. Now, I don't know where this all switched, but somewhere back in America, back in the early days, we would go out all night. For me, if I was in, in my house by the time sun was down, my mother never even asked me where I'd been and didn't even care where I'd been. You know, I had just to be in by sundown. Today, we can't let boys or girls in the Houston areas and Metroplex areas, we, or any place else in the United States, we can't let boys and gir- girls go out uh, without a way to, ke- to keep in touch with them for their safety and protection. They could not allow, back in those Asian days, women, young girls out on the street were not safe, so they would send the eunuchs along with them to protect them as they went door for door. But then wisdom also has her call. Wisdom goes to the highest place in the town or in the village and calls out to everyone to come to stop and to come in and be part of. They invite, she invites everyone to come and take a turn, turn in towards wisdom. Folks, every one of us in our life, where we're going down this road of life, we are going to have multiple times where we can either go towards folly or we can go towards wisdom. And we do not want to be naive. We always want to follow and take the wise route. That's not to say we're always going to do it because we are going to take the wrong route. We're going to learn our mistakes and that is going to protect us on down the road. Verse 4 says, whoever is naive, let him turn in here. 